Hello, my name is Tosca Bruno van Vijfijken and I co-direct the Transnational NGO Initiative here at the Maxwell School. Today, uh, I am undertaking a brief interview with Dr. Stephen Livingston and he's Professor of Media and Public Affairs as well as International Affairs at George Washington University Hello. in DC. Um, Professor Livingston, tell me a little bit about the nature of your research. The, the, the uh, linkage between media, ICT, and international affairs is really interesting to me. More generally, um, as we look around our world, we can see the impact that media of various type have on policy, politics, political outcomes. What I do in my research is take that basic premise and look at how information systems, just not conventional or traditional media, but information systems of all sorts, from certainly the internet with common applications such as Facebook and Twitter to somewhat more exotic information technologies, uh, technologies that utilize remote sensing satellite imagery, for instance, mm. that, are, that are able to take pictures of objects on the ground now as small as 32 centimeters from 420 miles in space. Not only are those satellites able to take pictures, they're mm -hmm. also um, a source of information about precise locations around the, around the globe. Here in the United States, we are familiar in our mobile phones, allow right. us to track where we are. That ability to say, I am here and I want to go there and this is how I get to that spot is all predicated on a source of data coming from a number of technologies that are in orbit, in our pockets, um, and on computers, software programs that allow us to utilize those data and make maps and make a, a, a product that allows us to be aware of situations that otherwise we wouldn't be aware of. That fact, that technological capacity I am finding, and others are finding, has significant outcomes, significant impact, uh, has a significant impact on the way policy is done, on the way institutions operate and perform, and even on what we call an organization or mm. an institution today. Uh, organizations are fundamentally rooted, uh, I argue, in an information environment. As that information environment changes, so too does the nature of organizations and what they do. I see. Let me immediately link that to, to the topic that we study here in the Transnational NGO Initiative. Obviously, the, the type of actor organizations who call themselves NGOs or uh, civil society actors of some kind that work transnationally. Mm -hmm. You just refer to that, that the information uh, network is an important constituent for a type of organization, but also that what we call organizations mm -hmm. needs to shift as a result. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, when we think back over the history of non-governmental organizations, I think one of the things that, 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 um, that is evident is, is that they've changed in their mission and how they think of themselves, the way non-governmental organizations operate, according to different political climates, different eras. So in the immediate post-World War II environment, uh, you know, we were very much nested in, a, in the Cold War during, during much of the half, half of the century, the 20th century. And NGOs operated within the context of the Cold War, and looking at, for instance, Amnesty International, focusing mm -hmm. on individuals and right. calls to consciousness. Th here is an operational style and, and even and the nature of the organization itself that was in part meshed with the nature of the times. As we move forward after the Cold War, there were changes in the, in, in the mission and the orientation of non-governmental organizations there. What I'm interested in, though, is the significant effect that the digitization of our globe has, has had on, on NGOs. So say 1999-2000 when the internet was, was, was expanding exponentially, within the last five years alone where we've seen mobile, simple mobile phones go from a couple of, of billion phones around the globe to now approximately six billion mobile phones, mm -hmm. many of them in the fastest growth rate found in the global south. Right. Uh, this allows for the formation of non-governmental organizations uh, in the global south that are utilizing simple mobile phones to collaborate, to coordinate, to achieve ends and goals such as simple price commodity information to farmers, right. awareness of healthcare concerns, uh, studies of ep epidemiological effects as we saw recently uh, uh, in Kenya where tracking of malaria was rooted in in tracking uh, people with cell phones over a couple of years, a, a complex affair that we perhaps don't have time to talk about now, but mm. the idea is, is that the connection between cell phones and people and movement allowed for the possibility of 
formation of groups and organizations that, that could um, gather information about the spread of malaria. The underlying phenomenon here is, is that technology has changed what we mean by an organization, not as a hierarchical structure mm -hmm. with staff and professionals, but rather there's something like an organization, a mm -hmm. virtual organization, mm -hmm. that materializes from the fact that, that people are, are going about their life and their, and their business with cell phones in pocket, that, and that data is accessible and it can be utilized to achieve the exact same sort of thing that a formal NGO before was interested in doing, tracking disease, uh, uh, trying to solve problems of basic human needs like clean water, clean air. Rather than formal hierarchical organizations, yeah. the technological basis is allowing us to do that. And you study those types of newer types of organizations that work with, uh, with and through this uh, technology, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is that right? Or Principally in, in Africa, but I've also um, been inspired or looked at um, the same sort of questions in Iraq, Afghanistan, um, South America, particularly Peru. Um, okay, okay. Can Chile. you give me um, from your research? I know you you highlight a particular couple of types of organization that either have the um, a role of of uh, helping to keep the state accountable mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. abuse of power, for instance, or for trading to cut out the middleman or for other purposes. Can you give us a couple sure. of concrete examples of organizations, let's say in Sub-Saharan yeah. Africa? Sure. W let's pick up, up with your, your second requested example having to do with trade. The one uh, example that comes to mind is, is a program by the Grameen Foundation in Uganda, principally. It's, it's called Community Knowledge Workers. Um, it's similar to other initiatives. One is trade a at hand. What these do, it's very similar to what John McPeak here at Syracuse does, mm -hmm. and that is, is to utilize uh, the proliferation of cell phones to provide information to farmers yeah. about the daily commodity price quotes. So for example, in Kenya or Rwanda or Uganda, using uh, cell phones, farmers are given the daily price quotes on coffee, what coffee is selling for, yeah. particular kinds of coffee is selling for in the international market. And before that information was available, a middleman would come to a very rural, remote, disconnected community, talk to a smallholder farmer, and really, quite frankly, take advantage of him or her uh, and right. under under pay for the cost of the coffee. And, and these are farmers who are living on the margins to begin with. It's difficult to, even with the price of coffee as it is here, the, the, uh, the livelihood of farmers in, in Africa growing coffee is really quite, quite bare subsistence. Right. So if you have that information in hand, the farmer has awareness that, that he shouldn't accept the price that's being offered to him. He can say, I have evidence that you are trying to cheat me. Here it is. So his negotiation He's stand. empowered. Yeah. He's empowered through information that otherwise he, he, he simply wouldn't have available to him. Right, so that's, right. that's one example. With respect to your, uh, the second part of your question, holding governments accountable. Yeah. There, there are, are many. Uh, l let me turn to two different applications in a sense. W one is called Satellite Sentinel, which um, is found readily if you were to just simply Google Satellite mm -hmm. Sentinel. It is using high resolution remote sensing satellite imagery. The imagery itself, the ability to take very clear photos of the ground and right. what's happening on the ground from satellites that are 420 miles in space. Uh, it's being used in the, in the Sudan to monitor human rights abuses because so often a village has gone in and simply obliterated or mass graves are detectable from space. Okay. You can see where the graves right. are. Okay. And through change detection, there's a whole array of images over time of that exact same spot. Experts can look at, and, and actually not just experts, it, mm -hmm. this is sometimes called crowdsourced as right. well. But people can observe the disruption in an area and can discern what happened there and they never set foot in that spot. Right. Now, ideally what one would also do is try to ground truth it, get somebody there to verify what you think. Yeah. The other example has to do with, um, it, it actually comes out of Kenya. It's, it's called Ushahidi, which is a Swahili word for testimony or witness. This is where um, people are utilizing the proliferation of mobile phones in the hands of everyday Kenyans, everyday Africans. It's actually found all over the world now. Ushahidi is a mechanism for crowdsourcing awareness. 
So let's say we are a Kenyan, it's the post-election period, 2007-2008, which is the, the source of inspiration for the creation of Ushahidi in the first place. I see. Um, your village in the Rift Valley uh, has been experiencing political violence. You're able to text in what just happened. Yes. And by texting it in, it's placed on an open source GIS, Geographical Information System map, mm -hmm. a digital map, and you're able to track an evidentiary base as to what happened where with okay. individual dots. Uh, those dots, if you click on them, you can be taken down to a point where you can actually read the, the, a description of what happened. Uh, maybe photos are attached to that posting, that, that mm -hmm, dot, mm -hmm. so as to verify that this is true. This is being used right now in, uh, very commonly around the world. One very interesting, at this point in time, uh, application is called Syria Tracker. Mm. And it's a new Shahidi deployment in Syria that's being used to track the human rights abuses that are taking place in the midst of the civil conflict or civil war in Syria. It was used for a different purpose in, in Haiti, uh, that is to say Ushahidi was. After the earthquake in Haiti, uh, you're crowdsourcing awareness of, of needs of people who are victims of the earthquake. So mm. somebody is, is in need of blood, they could text in, we have a person here in this exact location, here is where we are, they need type O blood, can somebody get us uh, this blood? It was being monitored by the relief organizations that responded to the earthquake and they knew how to get or where a need was located. So the situational awareness through, grow through crowdsourcing is really what Ushahidi is all about. I see. This makes it much more clear. Thank you. Um, how did you personally become interested in transnational activism, civil society, but also collective action? Yeah. I, the first half of my career, I've been a professor for two decades now, and the first decade was devoted to understanding state media relations, which is a fancy way of describing simply in looking at, for instance, instances where the United States was in a war, was in a conflict. It's often the case that we, we have these, these struggles between the White House and the Defense Department and the uh, American news media and control over a story. So right. I was writing about the CNN effect, I have a book called When the Press Fails that looks at the lead up to the invasion of the war in Iraq in 2003. Uh, and as a result of that research, I was being asked to go and, and to assist in governance development programs because I knew something about the way media operated. I know something about the way governments interact with media. So I was going to places like Lesotho and, and also in the, elsewhere in the Middle East and, and in uh, Latin America to a degree being asked to assist in governance capacity building. Mm. Let's get the state up and running to a point where it can interact with the functioning news media so they can have press conferences and issue press releases and, and all of the things that we take for granted. And I, in that experience, I, I discovered that so much of what North American academics and others take for granted uh, is, is missing and it's really extraordinarily challenging to create those institutional structures. State building is is an extraordinarily challenging undertaking. Yeah. And so instead of, uh, I realized that rather than putting all of our focus on, on trying to recreate states, perhaps there are other ways of achieving the goals that states are intended to achieve uh, without delving into a libertarian philosophy. That's not the point, but it, as a stopgap measure, can we find ways of providing security, health, health clean water, uh, accountability for governments that often lack accountability for the absence of a press, are there other mechanisms other than a formal mm. press mm. that can be tapped to create uh, what is otherwise missing in so many places? I see. Very interesting. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to limit myself to one more question. Um, if we think about forecasting, if you will, what is one issue that you feel is critical for transnationally operating civil society groups of the kinds that you've described, as well mm. as the kinds that we are more traditionally thinking yeah. of, the formally registered ones that are uh, more hierarchical to some degree or, non or another, that they need to, to address in the medium to long term and which organizational challenge will the, that issue pose for them? And as they relate to your area of research, yeah. of uh, I think it's the same challenge that's being faced by everyone from individuals to, to states, to okay. governments, and that's the emergence of big data. And big data is the term that's often given to the fact that, uh, that we are emerging into an information environment where information is absolutely ubiquitous. It's right. everywhere. 
I, I said earlier there are six billion mobile phones around the globe, uh, but mobile phones are just a small part of the sensors, the nodes that are connected together or can be connected together. We are about to be in a world that has 50 billion sensors that come from everything from your, from your, uh, your car. Your car is a running computer, right? right. Uh, to, to embedded ambient sensors in places like this room, for instance. Uh, that are giving off data, uh, data when you use a, your card to go through a turnstile at a subway or something like that, that's a data point. And so the emergence of big data where information is everywhere, yeah. that's being tapped into by sophisticated organizations and people and groups. So you can, for instance, tap into Twitter streams now and do mood sentiment analysis where by keyword searches, you can actually look at how entire populations in certain parts of the United States or Europe, what their mood is, by the, what, the kinds of words that they're using in their tweet streams. Mm -hmm. um, this is sometimes called data smog or data exhaust. Mm. It, it's, the, it's the idea that simply through the operation of a complex system, information is being given off into the, into the atmosphere like exhaust, yeah. tapping into that information as the case of the malaria study in Kenya that I referred to earlier. That's an example of where data exhaust, the use of mobile phones, could actually be leveraged to get a handle on, the, on how malaria was being distributed over a two year period in Kenya. That's the challenge, is utilizing that information to be more effective in your operation mm -hmm. and absorbing it into the nature and the culture of your organization in a way that doesn't threaten the organization, but rather empowers it. I see. Very interesting. It opens up a lot of ideas for research agendas that uh, we would love to talk to you about. So I have to finish here. I want to thank you for coming to the Moynihan Institute in which we as a transnational NGO initiative are housed. And I wish you success in the continuation of your research. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a wonderful host. Thank, thank you. Thank you.